Can you keep a secret? Changing hearts and minds. Changing. 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 You're listening to Changing Hearts and Minds, a show about reviving the warrior spirit and remembering the past to improve our future. I'm your host, Jeff Adamick. Let's get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, am I totally screwed or what? <laughs> You're funny. You're funny. I want to discuss all this behavior. Let me out of here! Welcome to part two of the Changing Hearts and Minds Halloween special. We like to reiterate that these episodes are not just fiction, but in fact do mention in detail true horrors and sensitive events that are not suitable for younger listeners. The fear of the dark is a primal fear we have had that goes back to the cavemen. Being out in the wilderness at night was dangerous and we carry that fear and apprehension with us today. Our first guest is no stranger to changing hearts and minds. Andrew McDowell is my unofficial co-host of our episodes we have on history, but today he joins us to tell about his own experiences with the unknown things lurking in the dark out in the woods, and he also tells us about the Bridgewater Triangle, a scary and mysterious place. So uh, I spent a lot of time in the woods, like a lot of people who are, you know, hunters and and fishermen. And um, I was out turkey hunting. This was probably about two years ago now in the spring. Uh, And I I have about 168 property that I have access to. And I was I was walking in and, you know, kind of just a normal morning in the dark. And then um, I started getting, you know, when when something's watching you or talking, you know, kind of in the room with you. Uh, you get kind of a feeling like you're not alone. And I was, there were no other cars in the lot. I mean, I was, I was by myself and, uh, I started getting that feeling and started kind of, you know, looking around with my, my headlamp and my flashlight and kind of just trying to see what was up because, you know, there are coyotes and fish cat and, and all sorts of little creepy things that, you know, run around these woods. And I kept looking and looking and looking and looking. There was, you know, nothing there. I figured, all right, well, it's better at hiding than I am at seeing. So I'll just I kind of keep moving. And I kept going and I kept going and I would hear rustling behind me and it wasn't windy. So, you know, and it wasn't my, you know, my back trail bushes kind of smacking back uh, as I was moving. And I kept looking behind me and the more and more I looked, the less and less, you know, I was convinced that it was an animal. So I figured it was either somebody messing around with me or, um, you know, there's something not quite all there. And I I couldn't figure it out. Um, And I knew you know, in these woods, there's a draw that I, um, I have a couple of trail cameras on looking for deer. And I, I changed my course to kind of move up this draw so I could, you know, even if I couldn't see what was there, you know, immediately I, I could come back later that afternoon, you know, I was done hunting and, and see what was following me. If it was a coyote, you know, I could, I could figure out how to, how to make a move on it later in the season and, and, you know, kill it. So it wouldn't eat, you know, the turkeys and the deer and all that stuff. And scary. Um, the what the coyote? Yeah. Well, I was about to say if it was this coyote, so that you could get rid of it, so it doesn't eat all your your game that you're hunting. Yeah. And also, so it stops scaring you. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm walking through the road, woods with a 12 gauge shotgun and turkey load, so there's really not that much that I'm I'm actually going to be scared of. But um, you know, it it certainly started to creep me out. Yeah. I, and I can, I can understand that. Yeah, and you know, it started getting me a little bit paranoid. So I I move in, I move past my camera, and you know, I, I know the camera goes off. It makes just this tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little sound. And I move beyond it, you know, kind of go on my way for whatever reason. You know, I, I kind of put it out of my mind, go set up and proceeded not to see any turkeys for 12 straight hours, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty much how turkey hunting goes for me. On my way back out, I decide to pull the camera, you know, card just to, you know, see what was what was there. And I pull it and I go back to my house and I sit down at my computer and I, I pop the memory card in. And I go through and it's okay, wind moving, wind moving, wind moving, deer, turkey, squirrel, 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 
and then me, you know, and then it was, you know, timestamp matched up and I go buy it. And then I have my camera set on about a 30 second delay. You know, I, I move beyond it and, you know, I, I, I come and go 30 seconds later, the camera goes off and there's nothing there. I mean, dead, nothing there, no wind, nothing. Cause you can, you can tell when the wind sets the camera off because all the bushes are moving. There's just nothing there. Right. And that proceeded to creep me out. And I actually ended up, you know, relocating that camera. And I, I just, I haven't gone up that draw uh, since then, just because it get, kind of start getting bad juju after, after you have that experience. You know, I was going through the rest of the card and I kept noticing in the same, same spot, sometimes you see on camera, it's just kind of like weird. It looks like a, like a snake flying through the air. Yeah. Like artifacts, and, like artifacts artifact. and stuff like that, stuff like that. But I kept being the exact same artifact at the exact same time. And, it, you know, it would sometimes be the long snake thing, or it was sometimes just kind of be a, like a floating ball that kind of came and went. And that's when I saw those pretty regularly. That's when I, I decided I was going to move the camera and, and not go to that part of the property anymore. You, you said that you were seeing these things at the same exact time. Yep. Every day at about um, about 3 a.m., which is right when I was I was walking through the woods to go turkey. 3 a.m. Good Lord. Yep. That is far too early to be awake. Yeah. You got to you got to beat them out of the trees or in this case, get stalked by something, you know, well, geez, half a mile. It looks like you got you beat him out of the grave, brother. That's that's what you did because God, that, yeah, that's early in the morning. So you're saying that this stuff this stuff creeps you out enough to where you don't even go by that 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 area anymore, huh? I definitely don't go by at night. Sometimes you have to go by it to yeah. you know get where you're going, but I I skirt it as quickly as I can. Wow, well that's that is, that is creepy, brother. That's creepy. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, man, really fits into uh, what you chose for your uh, your actual true life mystery or creepy thing, uh, the Bridgewater Triangle. And now, now let me ask you before we even get into what the Bridgewater Triangle is: is this thing in the Bridgewater Triangle? No, it is not. Okay. God, this that would have been perfect. It would have been perfect. Yep, uh, that would have been perfect. But you know what? Let's edit that out. Yes, it's in the heart of the Bridgewater no, Triangle. No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't do that. Because if it was in the heart of the Bridgewater Triangle, it would have been much more than you just having some some creepy little you know noises and creepiness following you around. Because yeah, Bridgewater actually, Triangle does not sound like it's uh, got a lot of good stuff going on in it. No, no, absolutely not. Um, so I don't know, just kind of for, for people to understand, um, Massachusetts, it's about 30 miles south of the city is a cold town called Bridgewater. It's, you know, it's, it's home to what, what I affectionately call swamp Yankees. They're, you know, they're woodsy people, uh, down there in that neck of the woods, woodsy people. Uh, woodsy people. Okay. Yeah. It's, I think I'm going to politely call them woodsy people. It's, it's down kind of halfway between Boston and, and Cape Cod. If you're, if you're looking on a map. Okay. And there's actually about a, a 200 square mile triangle that has become known as the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, it's not like the it's not like a, a vortex like the the Bermuda Triangle is officially, you know, in in, in the paranormal world, quote unquote. But um, there's a ton of just weird shit that goes down there. Uh, I actually have some personal stories that I'll, I'll relate in a minute. My wife actually grew up right and smack dab in the middle of it and she she has some stuff that creeped her out as a kid that kind of gives me goosebumps you know oh, yeah. today i mean there's like, um, I'm just just when i when i was doing the research for for what was in the bridgewater triangle i mean yeah it's it's a dude it's a potpourri of, of paranormal activity yep there's really yeah, no, so, there's really nothing that we could talk about that wouldn't fall into having happened in the bridgewater triangle yes exactly i mean it, it's it's literally everything from dudes as recently as the the 1990s have seen what they think are Bigfoot, yeah. which is, is Bigfoot. weird in this. There's this huge 5,000 um, acre swamp called the Hockabox Swamp, which in the, uh, the I think it's, uh, who, which is the tribe that lives down there? I'm running back through it in my head. Who lives down in the Bridgewater Triangle? Either way. Are you talking about the the, the Wampanoag people? The uh, Wampanoag. Yes, yeah, that's Wamp it. The Wampanoag. Thank you. I'm sorry. I can't pronounce the words, but I can I can remember them. Yep. The Wampanoag. Um, so they used to hunt there, uh, but it, they called it the, the place where spirits roam or or something to that effect. It was um, ha, ha, yeah, about place where spirit where spirits do, dwell. And it's huge. I mean, it's yeah. huge and it's it's rich in game and, and trapping and fishing and all of that stuff. Uh, but it's creepy as hell. I mean, people have seen Bigfoot there. They've seen uh, what they call Thunderbirds, so they're like giant pterodactyls. Yeah, uh, with all, all that uh, all that Native American um, lore and all that stuff. 
Yep. And which is actually part of one of the other things that that kind of creeps people out about it is during King's Philip's War, which is a, a war between the English settlers and the Wampanoags. Uh, that's one of the places that King Philip would hide. Uh, he was he was one of the, the Wampanoag chiefs. Uh, and actually one of the last places he uh, camped was in the town of Norton, where my uh, before he was killed was in Norton, which is where my wife grew up. And, you know, it, it, they've just, you know, kind of creepy curses, uh, you know, bad things happen to, to white people who go in there. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the, the local legends that talk about uh, puckwudgies, which are little, um, they're almost like fuzzy leprechauns. You can think about it that way. They're mischievous little um, little creatures that run through the woods and are friends with the animals, you know, and they like to play tricks on people. But when people mistreat them, uh, they're vindictive little mothers, um, so they'll lead them astray into the swamps so they drowned, or they'll kill their cattle or anything like that. They're, they're, yeah, I, I guess you can call them little leprechauns. They're like sprites. Sprites, yeah, they're, they're no, little kind of so fuzzy. You want, you want it, what do you, how do you feel about the thought that maybe it was a, now let me see if I got this right. You said Puckwuggy? Puckwudgy. Puckwudgy. How do you feel about the thought that maybe that one time when you were out in the woods, you were being little tricks being played upon you by a puck wudgie? Man, that would be cool. That, that would be cool. It sounds cool when you say it like that until you yeah. find out what these things actually do as far as historically, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. Like I had no problem with David the Gnome following me around until I realized David <laughs> the Gnome wants to skin me alive and hang me from a tree and use me as a warning for other white folk not to stay out the woods. Yeah, it's like Ewoks, right? They're cute and fuzzy until you until you're, you're until you're being cooked for uh, for a dinner to honor C three PO as your new god. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and you know, my wife has some stories. She had um, in her house growing up this being, I guess you could call it. She says called I think it was Harold and. Um, you know, he's nothing necessarily malicious, but he would, you know, just come and kind of mess with you. You know, he'd move stuff around up in their attic. And there were there were 100 percent no raccoons up there messing around, no squirrels, nothing. I mean, it was it was sealed tight and they made sure of it. And both my my wife and her her sister have both reported kind of the same creepy stuff going on, you know, to the point where, you know, she was she had kind of a, a really hard day at one point dude like materialized in the corner of her room and she just said not tonight Harold and he like disappeared <laughs> but uh Fantastic. you know it it's it's right smack in the middle there I mean you know I'm I'm not normally one to to say ah you know it's a spirit ah you know it's this that or the other but you know it, I think definitely there's there's something something to this you know there's something unexplained going on in this neck of the hood oh yeah I mean if you if you ever want to find out if uh and people, we recommend going looking up uh, Bridgewater Triangle and just seeing this stuff. It's got a potpourri. It's potpourri for everything. Yep. If you're into Bigfoot, if you're into UFOs, if you're into ghosts, if you're into little creatures, if you're into, obviously, you know, Thunderbirds, Pterodactyls, curses, anything. It's all inside the Bridgewater Triangle. And yep. if the fact that Andrew's wife has grew up there, and that, that's that's just creepier than shit. I mean, I grew up in New Jersey. That's that's creepy enough. That's you know? creepy as hell. That's, I mean, yeah, that's creepy enough. And then thinking I'm you could be digging in your garden, and there's Jimmy Hoffa. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's funny, Andrew. It's so funny you mentioned that when you listen to the edited version of this show, you're gonna find you're gonna laugh at laugh at yourself how funny it is you mentioned that. <laughs> we we literally <laughs> open up this show with me and my cousin, and talking about something that has to do with Jimmy Hoffa's body. <laughs> it's so it's really funny that you mentioned that. It. It's gonna be good stuff. Um, there's a place called Dighton, D-I-G-H-T-O-N. Dighton uh, Rock. In the, yep, Dighton Rock. Mm. Uh, it's this huge um, rock that has all these carvings on it, and they're they're inconsistent with anything that the the Wampanoag or, or other Indians uh, from this area. And there's no real kind of the the carvings aren't you know like I said kind of traditional or or representative of what they would do, which opens this kind of huge mystery. And one of the theories. I don't, and this is, you know, from the 1700s, is ancient Phoenicians. So these are Mediterranean people uh, who were who, who were contemporaneous with, like, the, the ancient Greeks. Yeah. Actually made it to New England, engraved the stone with images from their, like, cosmology. Uh, and the kind of the, the thing with the cosmology is everything past, present, and future happened at the same time. It's kind of this weird kind of holistic, metaphysical whatever. It's kind of like kind of like the uh, aliens in the movie The Arrival. Yep, exactly. Um, and there's this rock, and nobody can really explain what the patterns carved on it are. There's another one uh, theory about this, and this one's definitely a little bit more creepy. 
uh, is obviously everybody knows the Portuguese were explorers. They, you know, they, they explored the New World. They explored the Caribbean. They explored Africa. They did it all. Um, one of the, the, the theories, and I, I think that this one's maybe a little bit more far out, is that the stone was the last recorded record of a, uh, a Portuguese expedition uh, to the area, which uh, met with a violent confrontation uh, with the, later, the, the local natives, um, and that the, the carving was a record of the encounter and the, you know, the, the ensuing conflict uh, by the last few survivors before they were hunted down. Uh, and you know, it, it's a little bit out there. I mean, the, if you look at pictures of it on the internet, there's really nothing Portuguese looking about it. You know, there's, there's, there was a written language, you know, when the Portuguese were exploring. So why didn't they, you know, carve it, carve it in Portuguese, you know, the symbols are creepy and it, it makes for a good story. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing about the stuff that we're talking about in the show. And this, here's the thing that I got with a lot of people, guys, the, the reason why I put this, why I put these stories together is because this stuff's just fun. It's just fun to talk about yeah. some of this stuff and, uh, people, I got a lot of people that I asked to come on the show and a lot of people who just wouldn't do it because they were just like, oh, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. And it's like it, it has nothing to do with belief. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I do. I believe every single bump in the night thing is a ghost. No. Do I believe every, yeah. anything is a ghost? Probably not. Probably most times I'll explain my way out of it. But what everyone forgets is that Halloween is the time of year that we can talk about these kind of um, weird Spooky unspoken things, things yeah. and, and kind of have a little bit of fun with them. And uh, the bonus is when you get me and Andrew, uh, Andrew McDowell, not Andrew, the other guy that was on earlier. But when you get me and Andrew on together, you're going to get a little bit more of a historical breakdown of how it goes. Yep. And, and that, that's what I knew when we talked about the – when I when you told me that we were going to – you wanted to talk about Bridgewater Triangle. Mm -hmm. I, I knew – I was like, yeah, I, I've heard of it before, and then I looked into it, and I'm like, God, man, we could we could spend – we could do hours and hours on all the different things that are in there. Yeah. You know, that the rock and the, and the swamp, and there there's other stuff, guys, and I, and I recommend you go out there and look it up and, and read into it. And if you're from the Bridgewater area and you, you've never heard of any of this stuff, mm -hmm. you're going to be shocked when you read how much yep. paranormal activity is attributed to yeah. the Bridgewater Triangle, like we said, which is a 200-square-mile area. Just just south of Boston in Massachusetts. So yeah, there's there's actually an old Boston.com article. It's kind of a slideshow that has some of the the creepier points uh, on it. And you know, if you, I'll give you the link, Jeff, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, we'll share it. that. We'll share that on. Yeah. I've, I do have every single story that we have on the show this week uh, is shared. Great. Via, via link on the show notes page. So cool. I will. Um, I'll get that over to you. We are surrounded by things we cannot explain, and monsters who lurk in places we cannot see. Dwayne France, host of Headspace and Timing, and friend of Changing Hearts and Minds, is not one to be known to make up stories. He joined me and we discuss his and my own personal stories, and then we both give examples of real monsters who no one saw coming. You know, I, I don't know if it's going to keep your kids up at night, um, but uh, you know me to be a man of integrity, right? You know that I'm, uh, I'm somebody that's going to, you know, the highest ethical standards. Uh, and so, so I want to be as honest as I can. I cannot say that I've not seen Bigfoot. Well, the double negative being removed from that, you cannot say. I can't say, say that I have seen Bigfoot. Okay. I won't say I saw Bigfoot, but I can't not say that I've seen Bigfoot. It was really weird. I mean, it was it was uh, before we had gone to Afghanistan in, in 09, 010, I had a new platoon leader, which I thought that these guys were pulling the, the new PL's leg. And we were out at uh, we were finishing up a saw range. And so it was it was, uh, you know, the sun was setting. We were on the western side of uh, Fort Carson. Uh, Fort Carson has uh, sort of a lower contonement area. So where Bragg has sort of the ranges are all out, you know away from post, but it's north to south in Carson. And they're all sort of around a central impact area. And so we were over by the tower shutting stuff up, me and the, the PL and, and a couple of the section sergeants. And some of my Joes were over on the road, you know, maybe about 7,500 meters away. And they were freaking out, you know, pointing and yelling and shouting. And, you know, and I'm like, you know, you guys need to shut up. And somebody said, Bigfoot. It's like, get out of here, right? Yeah, Bigfoot. Bigfoot, right? You know, it's freaking Colorado. You talk about Bigfoot. And so I'm sitting here and, and Big Big Sarge is, is coming around to, you know, wreck some skulls. And and I walk around the corner of the building and I see what they're pointing at. 
and I stopped. And I I couldn't discount what they said because it sure looked like Bigfoot. Like it literally, like you know, all of these images that you see of Bigfoot in the uh, in the 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 woods where he kind of turns around and his arms are like this. Yeah. So this was it was on the edge of Fort Carson, and and so maybe about I don't know um, three four hundred meters away. It was a little bit farther in a distance. And there was this guy, I'm going to call it a guy, but it was this thing that was walking along a trail that was sort of hugging the edge of a, of a hill. And I explain it as maybe the shadow, his shadow was, but it looked like he was half the size of this hill. And this was like a one story hill, right? But, but it was this, you know, and there was the shadow figure and I'm like, and, and, and one of my guys, uh, you know, and, and I'll say his name because he swears to this day that he saw Bigfoot, but I, I can't say. But uh, but Jeff DeSala, one of my squad leaders, and he was like, saw this, that's Bigfoot. And I'm like, shut up. But I couldn't deny the fact that it really looked like Bigfoot. Now, now let me ask you, Dwayne, was, was the shut up a shut up because you were seeing what he was seeing and couldn't come to come to grips with your own common sense and logic? Or was it shut up as in you didn't want its attention to be drawn to you and the rest of the guys, even though everyone was yelling and screaming? No, I mean, it was, we were kind of far. No, it was, it was like, you know, shut up because I can't explain it really. And I was like, I don't want you to, to wreck my, and I was like, dude, just give me a minute and try to soak this in. So what do I do as a good platoon sergeant? I dispatched a couple of soldiers said, Hey, you guys go grab that truck and go get a picture of this guy. Right. Yeah. You know, as I want proof and I'm like, because I couldn't explain it. And, and so they go, and this was, a, and, and it was on the, the sort of the perimeter route, and there was a fence, and so he was on the other side of the fence. And then they, they drive like a half a mile before they go back to where the thing converges, and they were driving at top speed, and they see this guy walking along a path. Now, in between times, I'm sitting here, and so I have, and these are, you know, this was uh, before, you know, our, our high-fidelity cameras, of course. Of course. So I took this very grainy shifty kind of shadowy picture that if I still had the picture, it literally looked like one of these staged Bigfoot pictures. You have the arms like, going to the side, like he's walking. Yeah, Like literally that was like, it was like it would turn it. Cause one of somebody said, ah, and he turned and it was, and, uh, and so then, um, the, the guys, they pulled up next to it and they were like yelling at him. And this guy was on the path, but how did he get up that fast? And it was just a normal sized guy. But we get back to the motor pool, and and of course we're sitting. Or we get back to the company, and the first sergeant says, "Hey, give me an out, give me a range out brief." And I said, uh, I said "All, I all think men first, accounted for, one Bigfoot unaccounted for." <laughs> and I said, first sergeant, we might have seen Bigfoot." He's like, "Shut the fuck up, you're right, you know. And I and I showed him the picture, and like, and he locked me up at parade rest. He said, "Don't give me that bullshit," you know. But to this day, I'm not going to actually say that I saw Bigfoot but I can't say that I didn't see Bigfoot. That's, that's fair enough, man. I mean, and that's, that's kind of the heart of what, what the show this, uh, these next two weeks was about was the, um, you know, we live in a world where we're, you know, we're educated men, both college right. educated. Um, we're both worldly educated with, uh, with our time spent in the military. Um, we have found, um, I have been, I have been in area 51, for training one way or the other and have never, you know, there's no, nothing there that I could write off as being otherworldly. Uh, everything I've ever seen is explainable, but there are things in our lives. Well, not everything, but everything that I've ever been confronted with up into this one thing I'm going to talk about here in a second has always been explainable one way or the other. And I tend to try to keep an open mind and my open mind also goes to whether or not certain things that I cannot explain are real or not in this world. Uh, just because we can't explain something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The old adage that I've given people before, I've never seen a million dollars with my own eyes, but sure. yet I know that it exists. And right. uh, faith, faith in and of itself uh, is, is, a, is a source of, of things you cannot prove but believe are, are there because you choose to believe them. And uh, not saying that I believe in certain things, but – um, since, uh, you are in part two of the two weeks and I did promise many people that I would give my own. And this is one that, that I, that I just can't shake. And, um, 
I well, let me, but before, and, and I know, but, but to wrap this up and a lot of people are like, you know, what's Bigfoot in Colorado, but I actually did some research. Bigfoot is everywhere this. as far as I, as but, far as I've seen, huh? But no, this is apparently Bigfoot sightings occur in the Rocky Mountains at a greater rate. Like this is supposedly one of Bigfoot's habitats. You search Bigfoot, Colorado. There was a sighting of Bigfoot in February of 2016 in, in Colorado. That, that there this it was actually there there is a higher proportion of Bigfoot sightings on the front range uh, because I, I actually looked it up to try to prove to my guy Jeff that no there's there's no Bigfoot in Colorado and I could not deny that at least the internet says yeah you see that that's yeah yeah I'm looking at it right now man that is so so according to this then it's it's it's, was it Oregon and Washington state and Colorado are almost near the same amount of sightings. Exactly. Um, and that, you know, it, it makes sense because Colorado is such a, it's not, not mysterious, but it is still one of the few places in the United States where, in the United States where you have vast amounts of, of maybe not un uninvestigated, but un like people don't live in a lot of the, right. uh, the outdoor yeah, areas. In- and, and what we say in Colorado is along the front range. And if you've not been to Colorado, the Rocky Mountains start about halfway through the state. And so there's, it's where the plains and the Rockies meet. And so really it's, it's almost an edge of civilization. Uh, and of course we have a lot of, uh, you know, wildfires and things when people live in, in, in wild lands. Um, but about 80% of the population in Colorado lives along the front range. Um, and so the, the large, vast majority of the state are either uninhabited plains or un- uninhabited mountains. Um, and so after I started researching it, it turns out that Colorado is one of the higher rates of Bigfoot sightings. Um, and, uh, and I've not told that story publicly until now. So that's yours. Well, no, it's, it's still yours, but I appreciate you telling me because uh, it is – it is something that I think is very, uh, very, in, very interesting. So it's freaking weird, man. Yeah, it's so. just, it's just, it's weird. And, and I, like I tell people a lot, there's no shame in, in being able to say, "Hey, I don't know, I don't know," and therefore I'm not going to write it off. And uh, how, how, so how, so using your your military um, range, you know, training, you know, you know, distance and range. How how big do you think this uh, this this creature was you saw? I mean, if it was, uh, it was probably the the hill was about fifteen feet tall, uh, you know, um, and it was a pretty sizable. But so I'd say about seven and a half, eight foot. Wow. I mean, and it was, and it was just weird. And I'm like, no, man, it's. And I was in my my brain was telling me this was wrong, but my eyes were telling me that thing sure does look like what I would think a Bigfoot would look like. Right. So, all right. Um... Let me go into my story. My story is not as uh, really cool as yours, but my, mine's a little more like it, it creeps me out a little bit. To give people a background on this, uh, there was three of us in, a, in my unit. Uh, we were instructors uh, in third group uh, of a, a course that's called uh, Special Forces Advanced Urban Combat. So it's, we were Cephalic instructors. We, we taught um, you know, room clearing techniques and all that kind of stuff. And it was a, it's a unit-based uh, school. Uh, but you're attached to it just like an instructor would be at, at the schoolhouse. So part of what we did was we had to go out around Fort Bragg and we had to, you know, research and find training areas to be able to do this training at. Uh, you have been at Fort Bragg and a lot of people don't know this, but the backside of Fort Bragg over by the Spring Lake side is the old Rockefeller estate. Uh, the Rockefeller family owned a giant estate out in the woods over on the uh, the Spring Lake side of Fort Bragg that to this day is uh, – owned by Fort Bragg land, although it is considered a historical landmark, and it is not allowed to be uh, torn down or affected one way or the other. So it's a very large area. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, back, back roads, all, all fire breaks, and for those non-military people, fire breaks are dirt roads. So myself, a uh, very good friend of mine named Dan, who uh, I tried to get on the show, but he was out of town, um, but he, he, he would verify this story and and another man named Eric we were out doing looking for a training area and in the Rockefeller estate we come across this very large open field out in the middle of the woods and it's obviously part of the estate there was uh, concrete pads on the ground as if there used to be a building there that was no longer there and 
we're out there looking around and having a conversation and we hear a baby crying and being where we're at out in the middle of nowhere and being logical individuals, our first thought is, uh, someone's dumped a baby out here. You know, um, somebody's come, drove out here and threw a baby out in the woods. And, uh, this wasn't a cat. Uh, this wasn't a bird. This wasn't, a, this was a baby, um, a legitimate, uh, you know, two children I have everyone, you know, when you hear a baby crying, you know what a baby crying sounds like. It's instinctual, right? You know, it's, yes. uh, and it was a baby screaming at the top of its lungs in the, in this field. And so we start following the noise and we would, and so you're thinking about this open field, the, the grass or the, or the, uh, the underbrush is about knee high. So you can't see everything. Nothing's cut. We would get about five, 10 feet about from where we think we're about to walk up on the baby and there's nothing there. And then we would hear it off in another area, you know, another hundred meters away. So somewhat. So we started doing, we, we walked around Dwayne for, for two hours trying to find this baby, uh, that was crying. And, and I believe that I can't remember if it was Eric or, or Dan, but one, one of us is like, uh, I'm going to go back and, and see if I can get a better cell phone signal from the road. So he drives back down the dirt road while me and the other gentlemen are sitting there looking around for this baby. And he comes back about 20 minutes later, man, and his face is white as a ghost. I mean, he was scared to death and he starts grabbing all the stuff. He goes, it's nothing, man. Let's just go. We're going to leave. <laughs> and um, and you know, we're like, we're like, what's, what's going on, man? What's get wrong? Find the baby. Yeah. This yeah. baby, he goes, there is no baby. Let's go. And you have to understand that, that one of these guys, uh, Dan in particular is very, very skeptical and doesn't, doesn't really buy into any of the, of the, like he, Probably wouldn't be on a, a show like this or even watch a anything like this. He's very uh, pragmatic, very very logical minded. Um, doesn't buy into bullshit. Won't won't talk about things that are waste of his time. And he's shaken by by what's going on out there. We finally get the other guy to open up to us, and he says, "Hey, also I called the sheriff's department. And the first time I called and told them, hey, I'm out at this area. Here's the here's the you know the ten digit coordinates to where I'm at, Fort Bragg area." Uh, we have a baby. They said they hung up on him the first time, like just straight up hung up on him. So he calls back again. And the second time he calls, the dispatcher's like, listen, I can send someone out there, but we've done this before. Uh, there's nothing out there. And he's like, whoa, 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 what do you mean you've done this before? He goes, you have to explain this to me. Well, what are you talking about? There's a baby out here. She goes, sir, I have no doubt that you hear a baby crying. If I sent a deputy out there, he would hear the baby crying. Everyone hears the baby crying. There is no baby. He goes, well, that just ain't going to fly. If we hear it, it's, it's there. there. It's and yeah. this is what I was told. No, sir, it's not there because where you're at is a location of an old unwed mother's home that existed way back in the 50s and 60s that had burned down. Um, we, had didn't be, we weren't able to find out if there was any deaths associated with it, but an unwed mother's home. So you're thinking about very, very lonely women and their babies living in the concrete padded area that we were out there looking at and for years for years has been associated with this baby crying and people going out there and chasing it around so much so that the area really isn't used by anyone which is why we were out there doing a site survey because no one in the special operations community wants to go out to that site because this is broad daylight man broad daylight there was no nighttime and this was one of those moments in my life where for weeks i just chills Every time I thought about that place, if I drive out by that place nowadays, I will not even be able to look down that dirt road that goes back to the to the Rockefeller estate, the area of the Rockefeller estate where this unwed mother's home was and the crying baby that we spent three hours, that three Green Berets spent three hours chasing this ghost sound, this, this disembodied screams of some baby that had uh, somehow attached itself in either and that that's what got us was there was no there was no knowledge of what the area was beforehand right. to lead us to any kind of um suggestion or or misinterpretation of what we heard and to this day i can't explain it and to this day it scares the shit out of me man it really does and it, it, it i know that andrew uh is going to listen to this because he's told me when i told him this story he's like man i can't shake that story it's just the creepiest thing ever so so now, shaking past the the unprovable stories that you and I both just said, and much like you, you know, we have no, we we gain nothing by lying to our public. Yeah. So this is just a story; it's unexplained. Now, saying that there could be some weird kind of animal out there that sounds like a baby when it's crying that we interpreted wrong. It could be 
something nearby that the sound travels, but I can't explain it. And the story behind it is so creepy that you know what it maybe sounds. Like. Yeah, I know, I know, I, I know what you're saying. I know what I'm saying. But even to that, I'll even I'm willing to take explanations outside of what I thought I heard and what I thought I saw. But like most people would say, I know what I heard. I know what I saw. And there was a baby crying that we were never able to find and that the sheriff's department is so knowledgeable about that they won't even go out. They won't even report. You know, that's the thing is if anyone did want to go dump a baby out there, they'd probably get away with it. And that makes it even creepier. So there is no baby, sir. There is no baby, sir. But there is consequences having the fidelity to your spouses. And Jody better watch his back, Jody man. Jody better watch his back. And Jody, Jody better damn well watch his back if Jody, Jody is a motor pool sergeant in Germany. So man. go ahead, Dwayne. This is our real life story, guys. I will link this story to the show notes page. But this story is another one, man. You want to talk about creepy and something that's just going to freak you out. And something that I wouldn't have believed it if, if I hadn't gotten the Snopes link from Dwayne himself saying this is a true story. So, Dwayne, I, I invite you, sir, to start telling us about the dangers of cheating on your on your husband with his best friend in the military. So <laughs> that sounds like I have firsthand experience. Let's no, not, no, no. But, so you, know, a, you, know the, a, you know, the story. This, isn't, this is this not this is not a, Dwayne's story as far as Dwayne being true a participant. Life. But this is Dwayne's story as in he was there in Germany when this went down. So I joined the Army, uh, active duty Army in – uh, in February 93. And so I'd been in Germany um, probably uh, for about a year. Well, no, I'm sorry, February 94. So I had just gotten to Germany uh, when this happened. Um, and, and it was really weird. I, my, I was stationed on, uh, and it's a base that's been uh, torn down now or, or turned back over to the Germans, but it was Turley Barracks in Mannheim, Germany. And uh, if, you, if anybody had ever been stationed in Germany, it's really split into east west you have um uh west germany has got a lot of the nice places to be as far as kaiserslautern and and uh in mannheim and heidelberg and pretty easy duty stations then you have uh, grafenveer and hohenfels which is really the the uh <clears throat> the ntc and jrtc of germany right so it's right. the the less desirable maybe um well we got there and uh and there was a story in which a uh, a guy, another soldier, uh, I believe it was in Hanau, Germany, had beheaded his wife's lover, like mm. um, that uh, she was pregnant. Uh, the 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 um, soldier number one, I believe his name was Shap. Um, yeah, Stephen Shap. Uh, so Stephen Shap, who is the husband, uh, Mrs. Shap. Uh, he and Mrs. Shep had befriended another young man, Mr. Gregory Glover. So uh, it turns out that Mrs. Shep is pregnant, not by Mr. Shep, but by specialist Glover. And this is all unknown to the husband, right? Yeah, no, they, he, did, he did not know that, uh, that she, had, she was uh, pregnant with another man's baby. He thought it was his baby. Um, and, uh, and so then she... I believe it's when she um, uh, she was actually in the German hospital with complications that she finally reveals to her husband that it's not actually his baby, but it's their friend Glover's baby, uh, and that uh, that she would uh, she would like a a divorce. Uh, and so he storms out of the ho uh, out of the hospital room, well, and well, I think it's only fair to, I mean, to say it as. As it was reported, I, I've read it in multiple stories that his reaction was was of he was upset. But yes, he, he was le upset. He left he left the room eerily calm and like on a mission, as far as what I've read. So right. I, I, Story, I want to say stormed out. He wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah. this big. You know, I'm gonna go kill her tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it wasn't. It, but so, but but he leaves in a in a very deliberate way. Uh, back then, of course, this was before cell phones. But she gets um, she gets a phone, right? Right, she does. So she the hospital phone, and so now she's on the phone with her her boyfriend, Mr. Glover, Sergeant Specialist Glover, 
And so um, Glover is on a phone booth next to the DFAC uh, there in, in Hano, I believe it was. But right he was right, in the, right, the, right along the airfield, I think it said, but yeah. like right next to the DFAC. Yeah. So he was in the phone booth talking to her saying, well, what did you did you tell him? And yeah, how did it go? And like and so while he is on the phone with her, she hears the uh, the, the sort of the phone call get cut short. And so Shap attacks Glover in the phone booth, pulls him out, and starts hacking his head off mm. with a machete. In front like, in front of people across the street who are yeah. visually people watching barracks. him do yeah. it. And, and people but but they, they thought that he's but 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 he walks up to the phone booth, grabs him out, stabs him and and and, and starts cutting his head off, like literally beheading him. Uh, as if, uh, you know, this was some 14th century French, you know, torture. Right. He kicks the uh, head around, too, once he gets it free. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, well, he's, I mean, booting the, gonna, he's booting it around like a soccer ball. Yeah. And be a, soldiers across the street, yeah, soldiers across the street start yelling, hey, yeah. what are you doing? And he's got a great line. So do you, do you, do you recall what the line was he yells back? Uh, I, I don't, I, I was focused more on, yeah. uh, he yells, or this, this is what, this is what it's reported in, in multiple news sources. He yells, this is what happens when you, ch when you, when you fuck yeah. another man's wife or so, something. This is what, the, yeah, this is what you get for adultery. So, that's yeah, what it was. Just, yeah. you know, yeah. So, uh, um, the, uh, what a uh, public service announcement, just to let you know, just in case you were wondering what happens, <laughs> this if, is if what adultery happens. happens. This is it, this right? Is what so happens. this is just a. This is what you get now. Yeah. For so adultery. the wife on the phone, as you say, gets cut off short, but the last words she hears on the phone before it gets cut off short is your husband's here. And that was it. Then the struggle and the, the disconnect. So Sergeant, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Joan of Arc. Um, oh no, no, let me rephrase that. What would be better? Uh, Sergeant lost his head. Comes <laughs> back. He yeah. place he places the head in in a bag in like a, I oh, think, yeah I think it was like what they said a like a laundry bag one of the green laundry duffel bags that we have. He goes back to the hospital with it now. Wife who is nine months pregnant, uh, suffering from uh from blood pressure issues, sitting on the bed. In walks Sergeant Shap, and he deliberately and with seemingly no emotion dumps her lover's head into her lap and then attempts to get her to kiss him goodbye. <laughs> yeah. And I laugh, but, but good. I laugh because, Oh my God. I mean, he, he picks the head up and says, here, kiss him goodbye. Yeah. And he, he says, look, Glover's here. He'll <laughs> sleep with you every night now. Only you won't sleep because all you'll see is this. And he dumps the, the head. Bloody in lap. Yeah. Head of, the father of your baby. And he sits down in the chair while she's freaking out. And from what the accounts I've read is that even the doctors and nurses were just beyond the fact that there's a head in this woman's lap and he's covered in blood and he's sitting there, but his calm and so deliberate, just like, yeah, well, there's his head, you know, I've yeah. killed him. And he just tells the story and it's my God, you couldn't, you couldn't script stuff like that. I mean that's that's straight out of uh, you know the Saturday Night Fright Night movies. You know he just walks in and dumps the head of her lover in her lap. And yes, apparently according to the storyline, uh, they had drifted apart. Um, his, his marriage wasn't in the best shape, but he had never been violent before. He had never had any of these. Uh, she had no reason to believe that he was the kind of guy that was going to go chop his his his. And this is a friend of his. Uh, chop yeah, his no, buddy's were, head off. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in this, like you said, this is a thing of which urban legends are made, right? You know, be like, oh man, did you hear that time where some dude cut his wife's boyfriend's head off? No, like this literally happened. I remember reading this in Stars and Stripes back in the mid '90s, saying, "Holy crap!" Where where we were on Turley Barracks, there was like a phone booth right next to our defect, mm. and like I would walk by, and it was right across in the barracks, and I'm like, man, that's really weird. Like when we first, because you know, in in everything is like, did it happen here? I mean, it was just, it was weird. And every time, and I still even now, I, I think about our phone booth right next to the defect on Turley Barracks, right outside, you know, the our our headquarters building uh, barracks were sitting there, and it was just like it was it was weird. And it was literally 
true. It 100% legitimately happened. The guy, I think, is still sitting in Leavenworth. Oh, I'm sure he is. To close out you and I's conversation, I also went on my own little uh, search for a place on Fort Bragg when I first got stationed here. And my job in at, at when I retired uh, also brings back memories of this. And there's a lot of people out there that have watched the made-for-TV movie Fatal Vision back in the early, early uh, 80s. I recommend everyone go out there and look up the name Captain Jeffrey McDonald. And I'm watching Dwayne right now. He's typing the name in. And while you're typing it in, I will go ahead and give everyone a little bit of background. So Captain Jeffrey McDonald was a very good-looking, intelligent, well-educated man. He was the homecoming king. He was married to his high school sweetheart. He had gone to Princeton. He had become a trauma medicine doctor. And then he had joined the Army. And in 1970, he was the group, the Special Forces Green Beret Group Surgeon on Fort Bragg. And those guys are stable, man. You know, they're, they're, they're very, they got, yeah, very yeah. stable, very well, well known, are very well liked, very, you know, my, all my surgeons. And, you know, back then having the Green Beret, uh, much like today was a, was a sign of, you know, this guy is a, he is the best of the best. The and epitome. Be, yeah. yeah. And to be the surgeon for the group um, is not something that is easy for people to achieve. I remember ours, Doc Price. He was a great guy. Yes. And one night, the Fort Bragg operator gets a phone call from the residents on Fort Bragg of Dr. Jeffrey McDonald. And all he can say is, people are dying. Hurry. And here's what happens. They, they arrive at Jeffrey McDonald's house to find Jeffrey McDonald holding his wife. Jeffrey McDonald has stab wounds and a punctured lung. He has his wife who has been bludgeoned in the head multiple times and stabbed multiple times, bleeding to death in his arms. I think she was already dead. I think he was dying. Uh, in his, she was also eight months pregnant, by the way, while she's laying there dying. In the one bedroom is his, I believe she was five-year-old daughter who has been stabbed a grand total of like 30 times or something like that, and she is dead. And then his teenage daughter has been bludgeoned to death in her room. Jeffrey McDonald gets taken, and he survives the incident, and immediately they question his story. And here's what his story was. Four people had broken into the, into the McDonald home, and this is back when Fort Bragg was an open base. Uh, one was a black male with a camouflage jacket on with sergeant stripes, uh, two men, and a woman with a floppy hat on, long, stringy, blonde hair, carrying a candle and screaming things like, acid is fun, kill the pigs. Now, in the Manson, Manson murders had occurred. Manson what, murders just had so. just a couple of years earlier. And yeah. on the floor in the main room was an Esquire magazine opened up to an article about the Tate murders. But, but... Jeffrey McDonald had a punctured lung. He was stabbed multiple times. The house was a wreck. The word pig was sprawled on the wall. Mm -hmm. Two days later, a drug-addicted woman from, the, from, from, Nor from Fayetteville, North Carolina, had confessed that her and three of her friends had broken into the McDonald home and killed them. Now, she was a drug-addicted female. She had long, stringy hair and a floppy hat. Jeffrey McDonald gets the, you know, charges dropped from him by the military, ends up going on Dick Cavett's show because he had become so famous that he had been this guy falsely accused. And he's on there joking and laughing it up. And it made very clear to a lot of people, including the people who were his biggest offenders, which was his wife's parents, that there was something not jiving right with this storyline. And this is one of the few times where he hires, and he's living in California now out of the military, he hires a author to write a book called Fatal Vision. And the author is working for Jeff McDonald. And by the end of him working on him trying to make this story, the author is convinced that Jeff McDonald had done this to his own family. And so his story, four people break in, kill his wife and kids, stab him. And that's where everyone got it was, this guy had a punctured lung and was stabbed. What people failed to realize was, this man was the group surgeon. He, he knew, knew exactly where to, where to cut or tag himself to make it look like he had lost his mind, you know, that he had been attacked and not to, uh, and then to survive the attack. He also was on amphetamines at the time to try to lose weight and had been up for 24 hours. He had a, unfortunately was, was known to be cheating on his wife. And the 
forensic evidence at the scene was able to be connected because for the first time in the history of ever, all four victims, him and his children and his wife, all had different blood types. So even despite not having the kind of DNA evidence that they had back then, they were able to put together, because of the blood, the entire story of what may have happened in the home because there was blood of his mixed in with blood of theirs. And if he was attacked in the living room, as he claimed, because he fell asleep on the couch and stabbed there, he would have not had his blood mixed in with their blood. And the creepiest part about this entire story is, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll link to it and you guys can read up on it, but he maybe had had a rage and lost his mind killing his wife and his older daughter. But this man had walked into his little five-year-old daughter's room with a knife and started to stab and kill his own little girl. And she had defensive wounds on her hands, which means at some point she had woken up. She had pieces of his clothing <laughs> underneath her fingernails, which means she had gripped and clawed at her, at her, at her dad. And this monster... I mean, Monster had just completely mutilated his own family and then was on Dick Cavett's show not three months later laughing and joking like a yeah. maniac. And between that, I mean, there's there's certain things that um, – and I don't excuse murder. I don't at all. But can I sit there in judgment of a man whose wife tells him that she's been cheating on him and, oh, by the way, your baby is your friend's baby? Can I Can I judge him? I I, sh I should be able to say he's wrong and he is, but I he find is. I find it hard to make him a monster. I, I think that yeah, emotion. I think emotionally, divorce is an option though. Beheading may not be an option, but divorce is always an option. Yes, you know? yes. I like I said, I'm not excusing the act, but it, it, taking it a little bit far when you're playing uh, playing the hockey with the uh, with the head there. It's, uh, <laughs> when you I'm when you are, he isn't. He is in Europe. They are big fans of soccer. It's a good bit. You know, he was maybe he was practicing, but but there were certain times where if enough was enough, he could have stopped. But then. Dumping the yeah, it takes a certain individual, and I'm not I'm not analyzing from afar of of either Doctor McDonald or Sergeant Shat, but it does take a certain individual to lose it to the point where they do something horrendous like well, that. Well, I, I'm I am because I am who I am. I am willing to go out on a limb and say that I find Jeffrey McDonald so much more abhorrent than the other man because he he paced according to the to the police. He paced his kitchen, deciding what to do about the last victim, his own little five-year-old girl, and then went in there and did what he did while she apparently had woken up and was trying to fight off fight off her father. I find him just absolutely horrible. I find a man who, who maybe has a break with reality over some kind of a passion type based where he loses it and just all of his activity, Shap's activity as far as staying so calm and being so, so deliberate and so unaffected, if, if that's not – whatever temporary insanity is, then I don't know what is where McDonald just seems like deliberate. so, so deliberate and monstrous and maybe the amphetamines and the 24 hours of not sleeping. Cause he was on this amphetamines to lose weight because we all know that, 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 that just shows us a level of uh, a level of pride. You know, I got to lose weight. So I look good because well, he had all kinds of things going against him as far as him being a monster. And being a group guy and knowing that in group, in special forces group lore, Jeffrey McDonald's up there with a lot of other guys, but he has no redeeming qualities as far as I'm concerned. And thank God that even though the military dropped the charges and he was found uh, not guilty or, or, you know, was acquitted of the murder charges in a military court, they were able to put him into a civilian federal court by the rules that we have and uh, much like the, this, the, the man in the 80s who had killed the three people on Fort Bragg, he was able to be brought back and retried, placed in jail, and to this day claims he didn't do it, um, claims that this woman and, the, and uh, her three accomplices, who, by the way, one of them couldn't have been there because he was in jail at the time of the murders. So that just throw you know, she was a drug addict who was obviously not playing with a full deck of cards to begin with. But I just the mon as far as monsters are concerned, b killing your own kid like that, man. I, I just I just don't understand it. And it, it it creeps me out. So yes, when I first got to Fort Bragg, much like you, you know, trying to find that phone booth, I ran around trying to find the McDonald home uh, because of my sick, twisted uh, need to to investigate true crime uh, to look up 
uh, just just to, just just so I can turn around and have my first formation in the eighty second beat Towel Stadium. But that's that's another that's another that's story another for story. another time. But you know, I think the uh, the the moral of the story here is Jeff as well. Bigfoot may or may not have existed, and there there was a vow not to be a baby there. There truly are monsters in the world. Ginger Peterman is a veteran. She attends Syracuse University and is pursuing her doctorate. She opens up with changing hearts and minds about one of a set of experiences she has had over the years that she simply just cannot explain. I've never really kind of struggled with depression in my life, but there were three points in my life where I was just crying um, and just had this deep sense of, mm, I don't, I don't know the words to describe it because it's a feeling. And for me, when you attach a word to describe a feeling, it takes away the meaning of it because it's trying to apply a logic to something that's completely illogical. Right. So I was just, crying and just in despair right and and i didn't know why well you're saying so so when you say you didn't know why you're saying that this was just these moments where you're you emotionally just kind of lost control but had no no cause or effect for it yeah okay yeah i like i didn't know why and i'll get in i'll get in i'll get into it now i i just wanted to start off by saying that i'm not the type of person that gets depressed or cries easily like i never cry Right. I, I don't like maybe once a year, once every couple of years, I'll cry. Um, but I was like, <laughs> everyone gets a good, needs a good cry every couple of years. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm just saying this is, this is a supernatural event for me. Okay. okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So I was, um, I was about 11 years old. The first time I was in a tent. Um, we were going to camp out. It was me and my sister and this other guy friend. Um, and my sister was outside of the tent at the moment and I just like, it, it just came over me and I just cried and cried. I couldn't stop for about 30 minutes. I was inconsolable. And this guy was like, uh, you know, trying to help me figure this out, like cognitively, like we, we, we were thinking about it and I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't explain it. I had no idea what was wrong. Um, but I couldn't stop crying. It was just, something was just so awful. And then all of a sudden, just as quickly as it had come on, about 30 minutes later, I stopped. I felt this extreme sense of peace come over me. My whole body was at ease. It, it was almost as if the sun had risen from within, right? I'd never been so warm and happy in my life and just like ready for whatever. Um, and then not even like a minute Later, after I was all of a sudden good and I couldn't even explain what had happened that made me okay, just as much as I couldn't explain what, what was making me upset, you know, uh, just a couple minutes ago, then my sister walks in and she literally just says, we got to go. Grandma's dead. Oh, I already knew my grief was already gone. Like I processed it before the trauma occurred, but the thing is, is that I think it happened like, like, you know, like I knew before I physically knew if that, if that makes sense. That makes it was that, like, yeah, it makes sense. And that's, that's a, that's a good job building up to that. Cause that's a twist I didn't see coming in what you were talking about. I was like, I was like, okay, okay. We got to see what's going on here. And then, yeah, but what's fucked up is that it was my grandma Peterman and my dad was adopted there's no blood DNA relation between me and this woman who died. But we had such a strong spiritual co connection, which nonetheless made us family. Right? Right. Ginger becomes personally emotional, and you can hear how she struggles with how these experiences make her feel. After speaking with her for a time, she expressed that this episode has been repeated no less than three times in her life. 
And by episode, I mean the episodes of these bouts of emotional responses to people dying when she has no knowledge of it. We then try to move on to her choice for her true world horror or mystery. Let's talk about Gail Tree. I mean, she, she says she had to kill her kids to, to save their souls or to save her soul. I don't know which one it was. I get the sense that this story of Gail Trait is very emotional for Ginger, and with good reason. See, Ginger is a single mother and has a young son who she is the primary caretaker for. It was so hard for me to read that story. Like, like I almost had to read it with my eyes closed. Yeah, it's... And it it's, hurts. Yeah, it's, it's really, really creepy. For those of us who are parents, we all know the fear of not being able to protect our children. Ginger tells me that she has a history of schizophrenia in her family. When you combine this with the story of Gail Trait and put yourself in the shoes of a single mother who understands the risks of the loss of control and connection to reality that schizophrenia often produces in people, the story then becomes clear how a loving mother can become so emotionally brought down and get deeply afraid when confronted with the horror and the stories of Gail Trait. So that's why I know that, that, that there is no similarity between your story and the story of this woman. Uh, but there is because in the article itself, it, you know, it's, it explains that she suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. And after it happened, she collect, she, she said to one of the neighbor that found her, you are not my mother. And then she collapsed on top of this woman. And then the woman then screamed for the landlord to call the police. As I speak with Ginger, I see it's very difficult for her to speak about the actual story of Gail Trait. Me and her go on for a time talking, but never really get around to the story of Gail Trait in its entirety. <laughs> oh yeah, well no, I, I understand that. We go down rabbit holes. I, you, should, you should see some of the, uh, the free flow shows that I do with people where the rabbit hole goes so damn deep, it's like, I don't even know what this show's about anymore, so. But that's good stuff, good <laughs> yes, stuff. exactly, it's all the tangents. Yeah, the tangents are, the, the tangents are they're, they're a blessing and a curse at the same time, so. Yes, sir. Well, all right, Jeff. I'm going to tell you the story of Gail Trait, just you and me. It was late on the night of Sunday, July 16th, 1978, when neighbors began hearing terrible shrieks coming from the upper flat of a two-family home at 122 Montana Avenue in Buffalo, New York. One of them thought Gail Trait was just, quote, whipping her kids, unquote. No one called the police until after the screaming had stopped. And until after Trait, a 26-year-old single mother of four, stumbled out of the front door of her home, covered in blood. Lena Jones was sitting in the kitchen of the lower flat visiting with Gail Trait's landlady, Louise Peterson, when the commotion started. Lena was quoted by saying she feared that something weird was going on the way the children were carrying on. And although she asked Louise Peterson if she should go upstairs and see what was wrong, Miss Peterson wouldn't let her. She told me it was none of my business, Lena recalled. Ignoring Miss Peterson's advice to mind her own business, Lena went to the porch and rang Gail Trait's doorbell several times. The door flung open, and there stood Gail Trait, her hands and arms covered and drenched in blood. You are not my mother, Gail reportedly screeched as she pitched forward and collapsed on top of Lena, who screamed for Miss Peterson to call the police. An ambulance rushed Gail Trait to the Erie County Medical Center. The amount of blood on her led paramedics to assume she was injured. That blood, however, had not come from the wounds on Gail Trait. The source of the blood was found upstairs in the flat. The mangled bodies of Trait's four children were, in the words of one veteran homicide detective, the worst thing I have ever seen. In a scene more akin to a horror movie than real life, police found the bodies of Gail Trait's daughters, Amina, six, Inez, four, washed in blood on the living room floor. Both had been stabbed multiple times in their chests. The couch was saturated with blood. The television was on. It appeared that the two little girls had been watching TV when they were attacked. Even more gruesome was the sight police found in the kitchen. The oldest daughter, Kylia, nine, lay on the floor next to the body of her brother, Demario, who was only two years of age. The two children also had been stabbed numerous times. 
but they had also been partially dismembered. The medical examiner would later determine that Kylea had 63 slash and stab wounds and had died of massive hemorrhaging. Baby DeMario's right leg had been hacked off at the hip and his right hands had been cut off at the wrists. His eyes had been actually gouged out of his head. The severed parts sat on the kitchen table next to an open anatomy book that was smeared with blood. A bowl of blood that was also found on the kitchen table along with a plastic container contained DeMario's little eyes. The murder weapon was also found, a 13-inch butcher knife and a 7-inch paring knife. After washing off the blood gale trait, hospital personnel found that her only injuries were minor cuts to her hands. Homicide detectives immediately brought her in for questioning while officers spoke with her neighbors, friends, and family. The whisperings about voodoo cropped up immediately. Police were told that Gale Trait practiced voodoo and black magic, and that Gale believed she was under a voodoo curse. As for what had happened that night, neighbors reported they had heard Gale repeatedly yelling, Tell me I'm your mother, as the children screamed. The apartment where the incident occurred belonged to Gail's mother, Dorothy Williams, who was not home at the time. Gail had been separated from her husband for over a year and had just moved herself and the children into the mom's apartment on Saturday night, a little more than 24 hours before they were killed. At police headquarters, Gail kept cops guessing with her voodoo ramblings. Veteran detective John Regan recalled detectives were skeptical, and when Trait responded with gibberish to a request that she enter a holding cell, Detective John Ludaka had it, had enough of her and told her, I'll give you five seconds to get in that cell. Gail smiled at them and calmly complied. About a half an hour later, she came out and gave a statement, Detective Regan said. In her videotaped confession, a calm and cool Gail trait stated, you would probably say that this was murder, but it wasn't murder to me, she expressed. She explained that she had done, done it to save their children's souls. They weren't my children until I killed them, she said. And she continued, after I stabbed them, they confessed they were my children. After I did it, I told them to say I was their mother. She denied being angry with the children and stated that she loved them, but they had to tell me they were my own kids. In court later that morning, Gail stood mute and appeared to be in a bit of a daze to Judge Joseph S. Matina, who postponed her arraignment pending a psychiatric evaluation. Meanwhile, investigators were uncovering possible motives of a more mundane nature than voodoo. Gail Trade had voluntarily placed her children into foster care on May 17th, but they had been returned to her at her request on July 7th. Gail had told people she put the kids there in order to further, their, further her own education. She was a student at Erie Community College and had told friends and family she wanted to be a nurse. A check of her school records revealed that she had recently earned an A in one course, anatomy. According to her estranged husband, Gail's family practiced voodoo and black magic, though Gail did not. Charles Trait told investigators that he had left his wife because she was, quote unquote, popping pills. Though Gail had told them that she planned to study nursing and eventually move to Atlanta with the children, her husband claimed social services informed him that they were investigating claims of child abuse and neglect lodged against Gail, and that the children had to be accepted into foster care to give, Chale, give Gail a chance, quote, to get herself together, unquote. It wasn't clear why social services had returned the children to their mother after only a month and a half. Some of the children had reportedly told Gail that they liked and missed their foster mother. Interviewed shortly after the murders, the foster mother described the four children as beautiful and well-mannered. She said that the three girls were all good students and confirmed that Mrs. Trait had voluntarily placed the children in her home. Despite what others told police about the alleged voodoo curse, Gail denied that voodoo had motivated her. She admitted her belief in voodoo and black magic, but claimed that the bowl of blood in the kitchen table had nothing to do with that. She insisted over and over again that these murders were done to save their souls. Defense attorney Carl Vizzi saw it as his job to save Gail Trait. Never shy about speaking with reporters, Vizzi played up the voodoo angle in the press and in the courts. He served as a subpoena to Buffalo Homicide Chief Leo Donovan, demanding surrender of black magic and voodoo items he allegedly had been collecting at the scene, including four voodoo dolls he claimed police found burning on the stove. While conceding that many had recovered the anatomy book and bowl of blood, police denied finding any voodoo dolls, and prosecutor George Quinlan agreed. I was at the scene, and I saw nothing of the sort, he recalled. Carl Vizzi entered an insanity plea for his client. He also filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the county on behalf of Gail Trait. This suit blamed the county for the murders, charging that the Department of Social Services was grossly negligent in returning the kids to their mother's custody, and saw damages of $40 million, $10 million for each child to compensate Gail Trait for the wrongful death of the children she had murdered. The insanity in this case goes on and on, but when it turns out at the end that the only real reason why Gail Trait murdered her children 
was that she wanted to move to Atlanta and her family did not want the children to move away. Therefore, the family had told her that they would not support her moving to Atlanta with the children and insisted on her staying in the Buffalo area. Thank you for joining us for our Halloween two-part special. Please, make sure you don't allow the monsters lurking inside you out. <laughs> Seriously, guys, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did putting it all together. Dear Presley Bear, we'll talk to you guys all next time.